And so I want to welcome us to the presentation of today. Uh, this is uh, number two in the series, uh, The Last Generation. And yesterday, or the previous presentation, we did a synopsis of it. And today we want to enter fully into the text that we looked at and um, see what the Lord is going to speak to us and how is he's going to lead us in this particular session. And so I'd like us to pray and then be able to continue in the presentation, the last generation. Shall we kneel or bow down for a word of prayer as uh, we implore the Lord to guide us in this uh, time? Our Heavenly Father, we need more than ever before you are ministration and uh, your presence to guide our mind to give us the words that we shall speak in the language that even a little child can be able to understand what you would like your church to understand and so through feeble instruments and through this uh, network that you have given unto us help us to speak your word in truth and in a loving manner in jesus name i pray amen And so uh, I like to just uh, try to broaden what uh, we were able to learn in the previous presentation, and I'll be building on it. We have as if it were laying the ground for this presentation, and we want to come close to understanding what um, uh, the final generation have to understand and what is God talking about uh, this final generation. Now, there was um, a quote that um, I was able, or um, there is um, a piece of information I was able to share that um, the, 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 the phrase, the last generation was coined by, uh, uh, Emil Andreasson, and um, I read yesterday, and I'll read again as we uh, bring this to a beginning, that uh, the final demonstration of what the gospel can do in and for humanity still in the future. Christ showed the way he took a human body, and in that body demonstrated the power of God. Men are to follow his example and prove that what God did in Christ he can do in every human being who submits to him. And notice the word submits to him. The world is, uh, is awaiting this demonstration. And uh, I'll go right away to the book of Romans chapter 8. The book of Romans chapter 8. Uh, let us uh, read something what the Bible says. The world is waiting for this uh, Final, gen uh, 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 final generation and uh, what is it awaiting? In the book of Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 19, um, we read, for the unnext expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Ever since this controversy began, there has never been a generation that have been waited upon on the face of the earth than the last generation. And in the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 19 that um, it is not just the people are waiting for it, but it is an annexed expectation. And what is this annexed expectation? The manifestation of the sons of God. Verse 20 says, for the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So we are not just talking about human being being redeemed, but uh, human beings living in the end time 
being able even to bring liberty to every creature of God that is living under the face of the earth. These are the issues that the final generation have to look into, that God is not just interested in their salvation, but to bring in everlasting righteousness that even the creation itself can see the manifestation of those who are called the sons of God. And so, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and traveleth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. And so, first of all, we must be adopted in the family of God by his spirit, and then to be redeemed our body that corrupts into that that is not uh, able to be corrupted. And that is why ML Andreasson puts forward that uh, there is an annexed expectation of the final generation to demonstrate what Christ did, what God did in Christ, he can do to us or through us. And so, again, if you look in the book of, um, uh, in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, talking about uh, this unexpected expectation and the manifestation of uh, uh, the children of God and the sons of God, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, verses 19, we are told, and all things are of God who hath reconciled us by, who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespass unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so the world is waiting with unexpected expectation for the manifestation of the sons and the children of God to be what? To uh, have, to, to, to be able to be used as Christ was used when he was in this world, that what God do, did in Christ, he can do in us also. And since Christ overcame sin and was given the ministry of reconciliation, we are told we can come to the same position that uh, we will be able to occupy the position of even also having the word of reconciliation, meaning that in order for us to stand as ministers of reconciliation, the Father have to be manifested in us by faith through Jesus Christ so that we may be called his sons. And we know from the book of John chapter 1 that uh, those who accepted him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Emil Andreasson continues to say, when it has been accomplished, the end will come. God will have fulfilled his plan. He will have shown himself true and certain a liar. His government will stand vindicated. Talking about um, the government of God being vindicated, uh, in the book of uh, Daniel, chapter 8, verses 14, there is a war going on in the book of Daniel, chapter 8, and uh, there are animals that are there fighting, the beasts are fighting, and then they are just not fighting against each other, but uh, you find that they come to a point that um, after going on a horizontal warfare, they now turn into a vertical warfare in that we have their paganism doing it is work. And when it reaches at its peak, actually it is not only satisfied with it is warfare on an horizontal scale, but turns into actually a, a vertical warfare, which means that uh, the beast that follows the uh, uh, pagan Rome, actually, which is the papal Rome, that is uh, papal Rome is simply pagan Rome uh, 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 baptized. There is no difference. It carries everything that is of paganism and it clothed itself with Christianity and then uh, uh, under the garb of Christianity, continue practicing what paganism had been practicing in Daniel chapter eight. 
And so when Daniel is looking at everything, Emil Andreasson says that uh, God will do in his children what he did in Christ. In that at the end of the day, that his character will be vindicated. This word vindicated in Daniel chapter 8, verse 13, when Daniel is looking at the whole scenario, he says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint, um, uh, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily? and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And so while Daniel is looking onto these things, he see actual desolation going on and he asks, for how long shall these things continue to be? And then in Daniel 8, 14, that wonderful number tells him, and he said unto me unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be vindicated. You look at the margin, it is the sanctuary shall be vindicated, the sanctuary shall be justified. The sanctuary, the sanctuary shall be restored or put in its rightful place. And so how does the sanctuary get vindicated? How does God get vindicated? God gets vindicated when the sins of the saints are blotted out of the sanctuary and placed on the head of the scapegoat. And so we are waiting for this generation that uh, will make the sin not only go into the sanctuary and be forgiven, but that sin shall be blotted out of uh, the sanctuary. And this is done on the day of atonement, just when the sanctuary services are coming to an end, all the sins that have been going into the sanctuary and have been forgiven, now they are not only forgiven, but they are blotted out of the sanctuary and then God can have that last jury standing without a priest, but a protector and be able to go through the seven last plagues with them having an allegiance to God that cannot be turned aside. And so as Emil Andreasson looks into this thing, actually he sees that God will have a government which will consist of a people who have made their decisions to serve him. Now, there is so much superior doctrines concerning holiness and the vindicating of the character of God taught in the world today. And um, yesterday or in the previous session, I was able to read the book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, where we are told that um, be perfect as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And you find a lot of people coming up with um, uh, different interpretations and asking, do you mean absolute perfection? Do you mean this and do you mean this? And the issue is that we cannot measure the perfection of God the way he has called us to be perfect as he is. So we have to respond and believe that we can be perfect as he is perfect because it is not on our own efforts that we become perfect as he would like us, but it is his righteousness that is wrought in us through Jesus Christ that we can be uh, 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 standing in his present uh, perfected people. And so we have a lot of doctrines concerning holiness in the world today. One of, um, or on the one hand, are those who deny the power of God to save from sin. You find that people say that we shall be sinning until God comes, uh, until God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come. But then if we shall be sinning until Christ comes, then what is Christ waiting to come? Is he waiting for us to sin more so that uh, he may come after sin have uh, uh, um, been able to be filled in the same? There is nothing like uh, God is uh, uh, waiting uh, for us to sin more so that grace may abound more. There is a lot of interpretation of the book of uh, Romans that uh, actually does not align with the uh, uh, the other biblical data that we have. In fact, in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 5, I'll just refer you, for the people who say that uh, we cannot overcome sin, we shall be sinning until Christ comes. Let us remember one thing. In the book of Ephesians um, chapter 5, we read that... Um, what Christ is waiting is to cleanse, to sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, 
not having spot or wrinkle or any such a thing, but that it should be holy without blemish. You cannot say Christ is, um, we will never overcome sin and then read, reconcile, we will never come uh, we will never overcome sin. You can never reconcile it with the, the book of Ephesians chapter 20, chapter 5, verses 26 and 27. And so the final generation have to be a glorious church, not having spot or any ring or any such a thing, but it should be a holy and without blemish. On say, we have people saying that we shall never overcome sin. On the other hand, are those who flound their sanctity before men and will have us believe that they are without sin. There are people who go bra about bragging that um, actually they, uh, 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 they are holy and uh, 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 this gives us the doctrine of the holy flesh movement. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'll be able to touch on it, but uh, people claim they are holy and we looked at it, people say that, uh, you know, Christ lives in me and he is the one that doeth or speaketh the things that I speak. And so everything that cometh from my mouth is pure and holy. And so they, they have no need of repentance. They have no need of Christ at the end of the day, because if uh, 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 Christ is living in you and doing in everything, why do you need Christ? You have just um, to... Uh, 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 to to perfect the Christ in you or to allow or uh, to allow how can I put it? Uh, but um, this is this are new age beliefs that um, we can develop the develop the godhood in us. That is the word actually develop godhood in us. That every human being can develop uh, uh, godhood in him. And where do they quote this? They go about quoting uh, Psalms, which says that you shall be gods. And so when they quote, you shall be gods, they say that every human being have been uh, created with an ability of developing godhood. Now, do you know where that doctrine came from? If uh, you go to the book of, um, uh, if you go to the book of um, Genesis chapter three, Genesis chapter three, you will find in uh, verses, uh, uh, five, when the serpent came to the woman, she, he said like this, for God doth know, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And it is good that they came to know good and evil, but they did not become gods per se. They even fall, fell from their high estate and uh, became lower in their estate. And so, uh, we are in this last generation faced with two things. Those who deny the power of God and say we cannot overcome sin, and those who think they can develop Godhood in them in that they don't need a, a power from outside. They don't need even to be instructed in the word of God and um, uh, they can develop Godhood in them and uh, there is uh, the superiors going on. And so there are many skeptics both in the world and in the church and God is looking for that grain which will stand apart when looked at from even a far point that uh, the people may be able to recognize that this is not a superior one, but this is a genuine one. And it is a generation by the grace of God, it can come to a place it will vindicate the name of God. And remember this final generation, not one among them will flound their holiness and say, I have done this and I have done this. In fact, we are told with Christ um, that uh, in the book of uh, Luke, uh, what is the true faith? Uh, actually, the disciples came and uh, told Jesus Christ that increase our faith in the book of uh, Luke chapter 17. They told Christ, increase our faith. And then Christ, instead of telling them anything else, he went ahead and the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye, seed, ye might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root and be thou planted in the sea and sh it shall obey you. But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle say unto him by and by, when he is come from the field, go and sit down to me. 
And he will not rather say unto him, Make ready, wherewith may I serve and guard myself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. And then, verses 10, we are told that uh, like so likewise, so likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which our duty was to do. And so this is the last generation that they will not flaunt their righteousness, that they will not flaunt their holiness, but they will say they are unprofitable servants. Their perfection and holiness, uh, it is only God who can reveal to those who are looking at them that this is my people, these are my sons and daughters, and I have redeemed them unto myself. And so this is the generation that uh, we read uh, that uh, the Lord will be able to sanctify them. There will be undisputable difference between this, whole, this generation and the other generation that uh, has uh, uh, been there. Uh, the, uh, of the same generation, we read uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that uh, the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And um, I pray God, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, we are told in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, that to follow peace with all men and holiness without which you no one, no man shall ever see the face of God. Again, and so we are speaking about these people end up entering into sacred nearness with the Lord, that nothing can move them, that they will prefer, as we said, death over doing anything conscious to them, which is sin. A sanctified person is a person who is set apart for the holy service of God. And so they are not just preparing to serve God here on earth. There is something interesting we read in the book of Revelation chapter uh, 7, the book of Revelation chapter 7, um, about this generation, that they are not just preparing for the service here below, but even for the service above. Revelation chapter 7, um, and uh, it is verses, verses 15. Therefore, are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple and he that seated on the throne shall dwell among them. Now, how do we come about that this is the generation that shall be able to serve the Lord in the temple? We looked at Revelation chapter 7 when it was beginning and we saw that God said, hold the winds that he may seal his servants in their forehead. And in Revelation chapter 14, they were seen having the father's name in their forehead. And then in this verse, we are told that they are in the temple serving the Lord day and night, and they shall never leave his presence. He shall dwell among them. This is the generation that is spoken of in the book of uh, Revelation, just to revisit Revelation chapter 3. Uh, Revelation chapter 3 and uh, verses 12. He that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out and I'll write upon him the, the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is new Jerusalem, which cometh down out from heaven, of, which comes out of heaven from my God and I'll write upon him my new name. So this that are the pillars in the temple of God, they are the same people that we read in Revelation 7, 15, therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in this temple. And when you are beginning in the book of Revelation chapter seven, these are the 144, the last generation that uh, will never go out of the temple of God. And so we are looking at uh, a generation that shall be set apart for God they will be the first fruit, so we are told, and they will ever serve God. And so, uh, as I was saying that um, 
this is the generation that are not just forgiven their sins and their sins cleansed, but this is a generation that will make the blotting out of the sin from the sanctuary be something possible. And, and the work of the high priest, I use that word in quotes, and the work of the high priest, because after they have reached the state that the Lord will want to reach them, then the sanctuary services shall be cut off and the close of probation shall follow. And so the plan of salvation must of necessity include not only forgiveness of sin, but complete restoration and the blotting out of the sin from the sanctuary. And some people really ask, how is the sanctuary dirty? And um, what is making the sanctuary dirty? What made the sanctuary on earth dirty is the same thing that is making the sanctuary dirty in heaven, the records of the sins of God's people. And God says that he will blot them out. And so in, uh, in the book of, uh, in the book of uh, Acts chapter three, allow me to go to the book of Acts chapter three, the book of Acts chapter three, verses 19. We are told, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now think about again, if we can overcome sin, then Paul cannot be using this word, be converted, a past tense to a future event that is to come. Our sins have to be repented of that we be converted. When we are fully converted, then what follows, our sins are blotted out from the sanctuary. And so this is the generation that has to see sins being blotted out of uh, the sanctuary. They are not just a generation that will be forgiven their sins, their sins cleansed, but they shall be converted to the point that actually they'll bring to an end the ministration of the heavenly priest where he has to take or blot out the sins uh, from the sanctuary. Salvation from sin is more than forgiveness of sin. That is something that we have to understand as the last generation. Forgiveness presupposes sin and is conditioned upon breaking with it. Sanctification and cleansing is a deliverance from it completely, not only from um, it is power, but also from it is presence. So we cannot be taken away from the presence of sin when there is still a power of sin inside us. That is impossible. The first thing that the Lord will have to do is to remove this carnal mind according to uh, the book of Romans chapter eight. The carnal mind has to be removed. God has to work inside out. And this is the sanctuary language that... Um, when Moses set up the tabernacle, inside it was adorned and it was when the light, the Shekinah glory came inside the sanctuary that it was able to shine forth and even make the covering of it transparent with glory. And so God must work inside us and blot out the power of sin so that we may be taken from the presence of sin. We cannot be taken from the presence of sin if we have not been converted from the power of sin. And so God promises to do this for us. And then he can be able to do what we call the uh, final touch of immortality. After being saved from the power of sin, then we are saved from the presence of sin and there be with God all the days of our life. And this final touch of immortality is simply uh, a changing our bodies. And so our bodies, which are the temples of God, first of all, they must come to a point that there is no sin inside. And then the Lord can be able to do the final touch of immortality. And this is found in the book, Heaven, page 42, paragraph um, one and two. The book, uh, Heaven, um, this is uh, heaven, page uh, 42, paragraph one and two, the finishing touch of immortality. The life giver is coming to break the fetters of the tomb. 
or the tomb. He is to bring forth the captives and claim, proclaim, I am the resurrection and the life. There stands the risen host. The last thought was of death and its spans. The last thought they had were of the grave and the tomb. But now they proclaim, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The pangs of death were the last things they felt. O oh, death, where is thy sting? The last thing they acknowledged was the pangs of death. When they awake, the pain is all gone. Paragraph two says, here they stand and the finishing touch of immortality is put upon them. And they go up to meet their Lord in the air and so for this to be able to happen the last generation standing on the face of the earth the power of sin must be taken away from them the last uh, 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 the last uh, generation has to have the power of sin taken away from them in the in the book of uh, first john chapter three the book of first john chapter 3 this is what we read first john chapter 3 we are told behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of god therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not beloved now are we the sons of god and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he appear he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is and every man that hath his this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin so if he gives us that efficacious spirit then we can manifest the same christ can be manifested in us so that no sin shall be found in us and talking about when he appear we shall be like him in the book of Colossians chapter 3, also we read, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye also shall appear with him in glory. And so these are people that are, are going to be clothed with Christ's righteousness and they shall appear as even Christ appears. In the Bible, we find that um, uh, forgiveness, sanctification, and the blotting of sin has to be accomplished in the people of God, has to be accomplished in the people of God that they may attain perfection. And uh, when you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 2, it talks about the saints in Christ and the holy saints in Christ. Also, uh, when you read Hebrews chapter 3, verse um, 1, that um, God, before even that time reaches, he says that he has the saints living upon the face of the earth. Before things happen, he calls them as if they were. And uh, you can check, uh, uh, let us just read Romans chapter 4, verses 17, with that thought that uh, before they are, he calls them as if they were. The book of Romans chapter 4, verse 17. And there's a reason why I'm going to read this. Um, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before whom, before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead and call it those things which be not as though they were. This is talking of Abraham being the father of faith. And God looks in the future and calls a generation and tells Abraham he shall have a generation, a generation that are called the saints of God, a holy people of God. And so before it happens, he says that, it shall be. And so you can be sure that uh, what God has promised shall be accomplished. The question that should be resting with us, God has said that there shall be such a generation. Am I walking with Christ? Am I on the side of God that I be part of that generation that Abraham was promised 
that it shall be. When he awakes and asks God, where is that generation? Will you be found amongst the generation that Abraham was promised it shall be there standing? Now, you can be sure that God can predict something will be before it happens because in Revelation chapter 18, God says, Babylon is fallen, Babylon is fallen. That harlot woman is fallen. And uh, before even Babylon falls, God says that it is fallen. And so you can be sure when he says that he shall have holy saints set apart for his work, you can be sure that it shall be so. It is only us to exclude ourselves by disbelief, but God himself says that um, that generation shall be. And so despite all the waves that shall be blowing upon the face of the earth, remember Revelation chapter 7, seven says that uh, the winds shall blow upon the face of the earth, but the servants of the Lord shall be seen. Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 says that there shall be a time of trouble as has never been. But in the same chapter, we have told that um, there will be a people who shall be shining like the firmament of heaven. There shall be a people who shall be as bright as stars. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we seeing the power of God working us? And are we doing everything that is possible on our side which is to surrender so that we may be part of that generation. As we bring this to an end, uh, the last conflict, the last conflict brings the final test. But uh, this only proves to angels and to the world that nothing that the evil one can do will shake God's chosen one. We are told in Matthew chapter 24 that if it were able, Satan could even uh, 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 shake the faith of the elect. If it were able, he could even deceive the elect. But God assures the devil that he is having an elect that cannot be deceived. However much the devil knows that it is his last uh, uh, lap in the race, and he has to do everything to make sure that he goes away with as many as he can, he does away with as many as he can, God still assures heaven that he shall have a people whom even when um, the devil throws everything at them, they shall not be shaken. And uh, we shall be looking at Job and Isaiah, whom God touched and Job whom God asked Satan, have you seen my servant Job? And we shall see how this really replicates the last generation that even though he slays me, I shall still praise his name. And so, uh, the galaxy of the worlds that Christ uh, made and the inhabitants of the unfallen worlds are waiting for this faithful witness. Many people have been martyrs in the generations that have passed. And um, God has had his people who have stood in the severest test. You can look in the 1260 years of dark ages, but uh, then these all died without getting the promise. If you look in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verses 39 and 40, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, the chapter 11, verses 39, we are told, and this all having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Those generations that have passed, they did not enter into the most holy place because we are told while the earthly sanctuary was still standing, the spirit did not reveal the most holy place unto them. They did not come to the fully understanding of the implication of people living in the most holy place. And so all these people had good reports in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, but they did not receive the promise. Why? God, having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. That they cannot be made perfect without us. And why without us? Because this is the generation that enters into the most holy place and have an experience that has never been had before. In fact, we are told that um, in Revelation, this group, talking of this group, um, this group we are told in Revelation 
uh, chapter 5, and they sang a new song saying, thou art, at, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seal thereof. Now, in Revelation chapter 5, we find that the angels are singing this new song. It's like the angels are singing this new song. But when you move to Revelation chapter 14, the 144 standing with the lamp on Mount Zion, having the Father's name in their forehead, Again, we find that in the song, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. And so back to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, that this did not receive a promise because they have they, they do not have a song of experience that the, this final generation will be having in Revelation chapter 14. And so this new song can only be learned by a people who have overcome sin, a people who have overcome sin, a people whom God has wrought his power in them and they are rightly reflecting the image of God. As we bring this to an end, there was a war in heaven. And as I said, 6,000 years ago, the father and the son really understood what this war was all about. 2,000 years ago, at the cross, the angels came to realize what this war is all about. But in the near future, the final generation will realize what this war is all about. And then they'll have nothing to do with Satan. Although there have been times that um, the people of God have faltered, but it will reach a time that they shall reject Satan as the father and the son rejected him, the way the angels rejected him, and then the 144 or the final generation uh, will reject him. But uh, it, it is interesting, as we close this up, what the devil is actually still flattering himself with. I want us to look at this and uh, really try to understand that uh, the devil is not joking with the generation that is living in the this end time. Uh, we read uh, something that is interesting, something that is um, Uh, very interesting that um, in the Review and Herald, look at this. The people who are living in the end time have to understand that uh, they are living with a foe who is angry. And look at what uh, we are told. From the Jewish age down to the present time, Satan's warfare has been directed against the Son of God and his work. And he still flatters himself that he will obtain the victory. Now, you understand very well that Christ defeated Satan on Calvary and went to heaven. He, the, 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 the tomb or the grave did not hold him because there was no sin in him. But again, how does Satan flatter himself that he will still obtain victory in you and in me? That is the warfare that we are engaged in, and it's not a childish warfare. It is a warfare to decide destiny. And Satan still flatters himself he will obtain victory. How? How does Satan flatter himself that he'll obtain victory, that he will prevent Christ coming from the heavenly sanctuary? And if he cannot prevent him from coming from the heavenly sanctuary, then he will come and he will not find a people who are ready, you and me. And so we have to be diligent students and understand what the issues at stake are and know that um, because Christ defeated the devil, we can also defeat him, and he can only flatter himself, but he will never obtain victory. Christ came to our world in a form of humanity. All heaven were intensely interested in following him from the manger to Calvary as he traversed step by step the bloodstained path to redeem man. Here were the very people whom he had led out of bondage and to whom God had entrusted his law, but they received him not. He was the light of the world, but the darkness comprehended it not. Then, it was certain studied purpose to bring the Jewish nation into such a state of darkness that they will not know Jesus when he came. And this is the very thing he is even trying today, to blind up the people of God so that when even the sanctuary services are coming to an end in heaven, 
the people on earth are and clueless of what is happening. And so had they walked in the light, they would not have been thus deceived. Heaven marked the insult and mockery that he received from the very men who professed to be his children. They knew that it was at certain instigation that spies were placed upon his track as he went from city to city. Christ declared that he came to break the yoke of bondage from every neck and to let the oppressed to go free. Here was a work of counter agencies going on. Satan was constantly praising darkness, suffering and sorrow upon the rest. Christ was counteracting it. And that warfare is still continuing today. And it is getting more intense than we can think about. And so I want us to break at this point with this thought a thought found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 688. As um, we think about this final generation, think about what Satan is trying to do, knowing that he has a limited time and what he, he, he has to do, he must do it quickly and so fast. And think of ourselves that uh, God also has showed us that uh, the time left is so little. There is no one on this face of the earth who calls himself a Christian who still flatters themselves that we still have a lot of time. If you read prophecies, even if you can't understand them well, you can be sure that you are witnessing the period that was prophesied in the book of Matthew chapter 24 and other apocalyptic scriptures that surely we are reaching to the limit. And if you have never re read even the scripture, but you have, you have ever heard about the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where actually, uh, because of Sodomy, actually those cities were destroyed. In the times of Noah, because of unsanctified marriage alliances, the world was destroyed with the flood. And in the times of the Israelites, there were Sodomies in the promised land the land of Canaan, and God had to send them into Babylon so that they may practice their wardom in that land. And so when a world reaches at a time where Sodomy knocks on the churches of God, and we are seeing it knocking at the churches of God, people are now discussing whether actually people are born male or are born female, and if there is a third gender in that, you can know that when the church gets confused like this, God cannot do anything with such a church, but to bring his retributive judgment upon it. And so we are looking at the mirror of the prophecy and we are seeing that we are at the end of everything. But what is Satan trying to do? This is what I want us to see as we close up this. In PP 688.3, we read this. Satan. And this is the last thing we are reading. Satan was determined to keep his hold on the land of Canaan. And when it was made the habitation of the children of Israel and the law of God was made the law of the land, he hated Israel with a cruel and malignant hatred and plotted their destruction. Through the agency of evil spirits, strange gods were introduced. And because of transgression, the chosen people were finally scattered from the promised land. This history, Satan is striving to repeat in our day. God is leading his people out from the abominations of the world that they may keep his law. And because of this, the rage of the accuser of our brethren knows no bounds. The devil is come down unto you having great wrath because he knoweth that he hath but a short time, Revelation 12, 10 and 12. The antitypical land of promise is just before us. And Satan is determined to destroy the people of God and cut them off from their inheritance. The admonition, watch ye and pray, lest you enter into temptation, Mark 14, 38, was never more indeed, was never more needed than now. And so we see that Satan is determined to repeat what he did with the Israelites so that they miss the promised land. And just as we are at the borders of the promised land, he is repeating the same, introducing strange gods, introducing uh, false doctrines, and more so particularly in victory over sin, 
and the issues to do with the last generation not being able to stand perfect in the sight of the Holy God without a high priest, but we, not without a protector. These are the things that Satan is trying to obscure. And we must ask ourselves, have we never learned from the history? The people who have never learned their history are bound to repeat their history. But I'm encouraged by this. Life sketches 196 says, we have nothing to fear, lest we forget how the Lord have led us in the past. If there have been a cloud of witness in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and they were able to stand perfectly, some in the camp, some in the courtyard, and some in the holy, in the holy place during their generation, we can believe in the Lord that this final generation can stand in the most holy place a perfect people and then their chapter in the Bible as the whole of fame of the last generation can be written as the whole of fame for the other generation was written in Hebrews chapter 11. May the Lord be with us. May we be encouraged. May we not look at the waves which are roaring as Peter looked at the waves but may we look at Jesus Christ, who is the author and finisher of our faith, and triumphantly, through the grace of Christ, we shall enter those holy gates and say, this far we have come, Christ is our Ebenezer. May the Lord bless us, and shall we close with the word of prayer. Father, we know that um, you are setting apart a people that they may worship you in spirit and truth. And no one has been uh, predestined to be lost, but Christ died for everyone that they may get an everlasting life. So we pray that, Lord, we may look at the finished work at the cross and even look in the forward in the work that is going to be finished in the most holy place and have faith and hope that it's going to be accomplished in us as it were accomplished in the lives of others who preceded us. And so thank you for the promises which does not fail, Lord. Even when we have been faithless, you have been faithful unto us. And we know when we were still weak, you sent your son to die for us. And now strength and power has come to us that we may be able to overcome this evil foe that is before us, not in our strength, but in your strength. And so bless your children as they contemplate upon these things. Speak to us individually as families and as a church, and that, Lord, we may help in each other, starting each other with love so that uh, we may stand with the cords that cannot be broken and uh, we may make much forward as an army trained for the work of the time. Glory and honor be unto thee, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and uh, keep you, and uh, may you be encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen.